So my birthday just rolled around and I don't really know how to feel about it. On the one hand, it definitely feels good for your friends to wish you a happy birthday and we all go out to dinner together and it feels great. But I feel conflicted about the stark reminder that every birthday after your 21st tells you that you're that far out of your childhood. Now I know that there are plenty of people who enjoy being adults much more than being children, and sometimes I feel that way, but there's a little something melancholic about knowing that your days of childlike wonder are that far behind you. And a lot of the times that I sit back and reflect on that, it puts me into this funk of seasonal depression that takes me some time to get out of. But in the midst of this seasonal depression, I turn to my classic vice to get my mind off of the more somber topics in life, and that is playing video games. So today I want to go over some games that I think are great when you're trying to tackle the subject of sadness. And this short list that I have compiled is what I hope you can use to tackle similar feelings of dread or monotony. With all that said, here are my picks for video games for sadness. Let's face it, ending relationships is never fun. Even when you want to get out of a relationship, it's scary and intense whenever you want to step out of a zone that you felt comfort in for as long as you were in it. And oftentimes, pretty quick after your relationship ends, you have a moment where you want to talk to someone else and you realize that you no longer have the person that's generally your first pick off the bench to talk with. I used to think that nobody else could understand what I was going through after being in a relationship, but that mindset really started to change after playing Maquette. Although for some reason Steam reviews don't seem to agree with me. Maquette is a love letter to anybody who may feel down in the dumps after ending a relationship with somebody that they really care about. While it seems like a simple and entertaining puzzle game, it's broken up by different segments of you, the main character, and your ex-girlfriend's relationship, from first glance all the way to a messy breakup. In addition to well-voiced lines by Bryce Dallas Howard and Seth Gable, the story recaps how so many little different things can add up to everything in a relationship crashing down and how people choose to deal with their pain. As you solve puzzles that unlock different memories of your character Michael's mind, you start to see how Michael and Kenzie fall in and out of love. And in the latter half of this game, through the level layout and the less recurring and often cryptic messaging as the game progresses, you can see Michael fall into what can only be described as a dark world of loneliness. As I played through the game for the first time, I started to draw similarities between my past relationships and Michael's and noticed that maybe I wasn't alone in my personal struggles with relationships. And as I progressed even further, I realized that I was definitely not alone in feeling the way that I've felt after my relationships have ended in the past. I can go on and on about what I like about the game, but I think the most important part of the game is the way that it ends. You see, as you walk along the game and solve puzzles, you're not only unlocking memories of Michael and Kenzie, but also what seems to be lines of a long poem or book from Michael's perspective about the relationship. But at the very end of the game, right before the last cutscene, the last two lines give all of the other lines in the game a bigger meaning. I wrote you this letter in search of closure, but I'm not sure what closure is. Things end, that's the closure. Maybe I need to write this down to remember how grateful I am for what we shared, and maybe now I don't need to send it. These two lines let us know two different things. The first is that all of these lines throughout the game were a letter Michael was writing to Kenzie, which by writing the letter, he realized he did not need to give her as it reminded him of everything he experienced from their time together. And secondly, most importantly, what the player takes away from the game is the realization that life isn't really like a Disney love movie. People love each other, sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. Closure isn't professing your love at the end of a tired and exhausted relationship or getting the last laugh on a person who wronged you. Closure is moving on and going to your next chapter in your life. And as you move on, so does life as the game illustrates with growing flowers after Michael and Kenzie say their goodbyes for the last time. There's something therapeutic about finishing this game, whether it's the knowing that you're part of the everyone who has experienced a relationship come to a close, or just that you needed a story to make you feel something. Maquette is always a game I look to when I'm feeling blue. Now let's turn to my biggest fear and the pinnacle of my depression. I have a lot of fears. I hate spiders. I hate heights. I've had an irrational fear of the Chuck E. Cheese animatronics way before Five Nights at Freddy's multiplied it tenfold. But none of these fears make me sad, which is the theme of the video. 
I suffer from a crippling fear of failure. There are many times where I feel like I won't or I don't belong somewhere that I think that many people's opinions of me are below my own opinion. And this fear of failure some days gets so bad that I don't end up doing anything during the day for fear that I might mess something up. And I think that a lot of games can play on this fear of failure. For example, many people don't push onto a site in Counter-Strike or Valorant due to their own fear of dying without giving any help to the team. Or in Until Dawn, choosing the safe path in chase sections means taking a slower path to not risk failing a quick time event and getting a character killed. All the while, you can get your character killed by taking a slower path anyways. There are so many deaths caused by many fears of failure in video games that sometimes you can feel like you're stuck in the game as well. Now you want to see what death is like in Ori? I mean, well that's not bad at all. The Ori games are one of the two Metroidvanias leading the way into the new age of games, the other being Hollow Knight. But out of the two franchises, the Ori games have always been my favorite due to their emphasis on movement and fluidity compared to Hollow Knight's more feel of Dark Souls. And the game that this segment is about is Ori and the Will of the Wisps. The 2020 Xbox Game of the Year winner features not only the most breathtaking environment ever put on a screen, but an endlessly powerful and brilliantly composed music score to go along with it. The difference between this game and its predecessor, Ori and the Blind Forest, is that in the first one you run around evading attacks, and in this one you really become able to fight back. In addition to new movement and combat abilities, the world that Ori is set in is one of the most immersive and thought-provoking worlds that I've ever had the experience of exploring, and the setting seems to breed creativity in your own mind. You're constantly trying to use different abilities and approach problems with different angles to get to a new area or beat a new enemy. And this cathartic expression of your own thoughts can really start to affect the mindset of your life outside the game as well. Every time I'm in the outside world after playing a game like Ori, I start to have a new appreciation of the beauties of natural life. And from this appreciation, I start to gain the confidence of, hey, you know what? It is going to work out in the end. Thus, my crippling fear of failure is curbed a little bit. Really, this form of sadness comes down to overthought on the bad parts of life. And using games like Ori as canvases to paint a new mindset, you can alleviate the stress that the outer world can have on you. I think that it's important to recognize that I'm just one person in the gaming scene and have my own specific opinions when it comes to what I'm looking for in specific games. And that extends to the topic of this video especially because I'm talking about games that feel comfortable to me. But I realize that what I may find comforting is not exactly what everyone else is looking for, so for this segment I did a little bit of outsourcing. So what I did for this intermission is ask my friends what games they turn to when they're feeling sad and give a little bit of an insight as to why they're doing it. I like playing Bloons Tower Defense 6 when I'm sad because uh, all the monkeys popping the balloons uh, is really satisfying and make my brain go burr. Um, so the game I chose is Undertale and a lot of that has to do with because when I'm feeling like not so good I like to focus on like a different world I guess. So um, with Undertale there's just like so much to it and I like being able to like think through like or see through the eye like eyes of someone else um so yeah i really like um either playing that game or watching playthroughs of that game i've done it like multiple times already my favorite game to play when i'm sad is a uh, beat saber because it really helps me relieve some stress by moving around and kind of gets me out of my head state by putting me in like somewhere else entirely you know with the vr You know, when I think of the most consistently sad things, I have to circle back to what I said at the start of this video being the fact that I'm getting older. Nostalgia is one of the most sadness-inducing feelings in the world. The entire premise behind it, as a whole, is looking back to a better or simpler time, like in elementary school where the most stressful thing in life was learning to play soccer on the school field. So for the final spot, I've reserved a little bit of a cop-out answer. Probably the best game for you to play when you're in a state of sadness is whatever nostalgic title you can attribute to your childhood or the best parts of your life. For me, I grew up in the DS era of Pokemon. 
While my favorite games now as a full grown adult looking back were the Mario Galaxy games, I can't help but to attribute Pokemon to more memories in my childhood. Take my elementary school, I remember vividly when Pokemon Heart Gold was released with the Pokewalker toys, those toys that connected to your DS and you could put a Pokemon from your game onto the mini screen on the toy and walk around with it. I remember putting my Raikou or Kingdra on the toy and taking it to school to show my elementary school friends how far along in the game I was until the school found out how how much fun we were having and they were obligated to ban them from the campus. Like seriously, why did schools do that? Even during recesses, if we wanted to have fun and like play with our new toy, we weren't allowed to do it. But I digress, another memory that I had when I was a child was I remember beating Super Mario Bros. Wii for the first time with my close-knit group of childhood friends who I still talk with every day. And I think that these moments are some of the building blocks that have helped nourish such a close future between me and these people that I met when I was six years old. So whether you're 25 or 17 or 50 or 10 or whatever, if you're feeling down, you can look to either the video games or really anything else you did to revisit some of that childlike wonder to really ground you and remind you that your roots grew you into the person that you are. Because sometimes a reminder of where you came from can make the path clearer to where you want to be. You know, in all truth, I started the script for this video in the middle of a depressive funk I was having around my birthday. And now it's been a couple weeks to maybe even a month or two months or something like that that I really just got out of that funk. If it emphasizes anything in this video, I did play all three of these games to cope with the mood that I was in. I think that depression, anxiety, and sadness in general, while sometimes being something that needs clinical help, can also be curbed by doing things that you just enjoy doing. That's not to say you shouldn't seek professional help if you feel how you feel, but the existence of these cathartic games as well as other activities can help you get out of that funk that you're in. But you know what can cure a lot of forms of depression related to video games? Is if you would stop playing games made by Riot, you dumbass. Oh. <laughs> hey, Justin. 